Hello students, welcome to EPG Patashala. My name is Dr. K. R. Ram Mohan, Associate Professor, Head Department of Anthropology, Sikkim University. Today we are going to talk on module Culture and Personality Studies, Part 2, which comes under the paper Theories and Methods in Social and Cultural Anthropology. The objectives of this module is to equip the students with the culture and personality studies by Mary Douglas, Arthur Kleinman, Anthony F. Wallace, Melford Spiro. The other objective is to see how psychology has been integrated into culture. Mary Douglas works are important to understand the enculturation and symbolic process which is another important objective in this module. Now starting with Mary Douglas works on the whole enculturation process. Enculturation process is basically understood the child rearing practices, basically child rearing process, which is a certain period of lifespan, which is not socialization. Socialization is entire lifespan process, but enculturation process is only up to certain level until you become an adolescent. So that period is called enculturation, which compels new generation to reproduce an established lifestyle. So every culture has a set of norms, set of standards of behavior, which warrants the individual members to stick to these confined or institutionalized or established modes of life. We can go on with examples of uh, how to behave in, 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 uh, in a family, how to behave in primary groups, how to behave in secondary groups, how to behave with other fellow members, how to behave in an official setting. All these things come and can pass the entire lifestyle pattern. <coughs> Mary Douglas also highlighted the group and the grid views to deal with the cultural bias. Why certain people have bias towards other cultures? This is uh, an explanation which is given by that. That is basically a kind of a personality issue which we see other cultures as inferior or other cultures as something uh, low to our own culture, which is basically an ethnocentric view of understanding the cultures. Other important aspect in this module is that author Kleinman addressed the interaction of culture and mental illness or the psychological disorders. Whether psychological disorders are biologically per se or psychological disorders are, are being facilitated by the cultural process, which only the culture and personality school can give some understanding of this dyadic process. Psychiatrists on the, on the hand, they see psychological disorders as malfunctioning of the body. Cultural disorders are also perceived in terms of or understood in terms of pure scientific biological ways. But anthropology looks into whether abnormalities or disorders are being triggered or being facilitated by given set of cultural norms where individuals become deviate and lead to the established uh, scientific or cultural pure psychological terms of uh, mental illness or psychological illness. So taking further, Wallace, Alfred Wallace makes out certain ethno-historical data pertaining to mostly to uh, American Indian acculturation. He studied as communities in Americas where to see how uh, in a sense that uh, uh, cultures 
perceived from an historical point of view and their data, particularly how they have been accultured. Uh, and this gave a new importance to all the future generation of anthropologists. Well, this also talks about the whole revitalization process, then how culture takes on different shapes uh, in the due course of historical process and uh, what are these revitalization movement. Another important uh, anthropologist in this school of thought is Melford Spiro, which emphasizes on the a theoretical importance of unconscious desires and beliefs in the study of stability and change, particularly with the social and cultural systems. So this has again dealt with the Freudian understanding of uh, the unconscious aspect of mind or the subconscious things of this mind and to what extent this unfulfilled desires which triggers some kind of an anomaly in a given cultural system whether this unfulfilled desires, unattended desires, wishful desires which have not been satisfied, which are not been met adequately, can lead to stability and a change in the social and cultural system. What does it mean? Means that if all the members have fulfilled desires, does it mean that it goes on stability for a longer period of time? Or if there is a, some kind of changes that takes place at individual and collective level which it dethrones the existing cultural system is basically understood from this point of view, particularly in family at the level of family at the level of political organization or even at religion so to what extent religion facilitates these things or socially control the desires to what extent the governments regulates the human behavior and to what extent the family regulates individual desires which are not being spilled over or leading to chaos and all these things. Now, like we have discussed uh, in the previous uh, classes that uh, what is that the form of basic personality structure approach uh, to the new culture and personality studies by these anthropologists uh, which have been showcasing themes for developing culture in terms of interplay between psychology, religion and socio-economic backgrounds. So now the, the widening part is that how religion plays, how religion shapes people's attitudes, how religion shapes people's belief systems, how religion shapes the entire understanding of the social worldview, how people categorize these world objects, not objects, these things, inanimate objects, how, what, what makes the, a, a community to segregate these objects and what makes people to think and to act in such a way that uh, where social and political economic grounds influence the thinking pattern. So new culture and personality studies by Mary Douglas, Kleinman, Wallace and Spiro highlighted that uh, by adding uh, that uh, mostly psychological uh, processes takes the uh, big stage or be in, the, in the base step in understanding the entire gamut of uh, social behavior. So coming to Mary Douglas enculturation uh, process which compels new generation to reproduce established lifestyle and uh, uh, Wallace makes that these historical, ethno-historical background will probably count in uh, aiding more uh, to uh, understanding of uh, these things. Now, with these studies, how the social institutions of uh, uh, family, religion and the socio-political institutions will uh, act and facilitate uh, uh, individual uh, psyche to the collective psyche. Now, at one level we have basic personality structure which gives model personality and these two combined we understand in the greater realm of psychological anthropology where all the authors of uh, Wallace, Mary Douglas, Kleinman and Melford Spiro as uh, given their contributions and their perspectives. 
coming to Douglas, as he gave the uh, newer views on this group and grid views, Kleinman has given a new understanding, what we call as new cultural psychiatry. Cultural psychiatry is a very uh, uh, a welcome understanding of uh, how psychological disorders are understood within a culture. Why particular culture has this psychological disorders? Why another culture has this particular disorder? Or why this culture is absence of psychological disorders? If that is the case, psychiatry is a product of culture rather than a biological feature. Like the, the biological variability or the biological physical problems that all human beings, when they interact with the environment, get into this thing, whether psychiatric disorders are also has the cultural base into that. And Wallace's contribution is basically towards the theory of revitalization, how certain things are being revitalized through the individual psyche process. And Spiro talks on how religion shapes one's personality, to what extent religion has a role to shape and reshape individual psyche at a collective level. Now, let us look into Mary Douglas' uh, contributions towards uh, uh, culture and personality and how she uh, thinks this group use. Douglas basically, Mary Douglas basically took uh, documents, uh, structuralist aspect that the psychic unity with a strong interest in religion. Because Darkiam has published the, the elementary forms of religion. So Mary Douglas was particularly interested that uh, what are the elementary structures of uh, religion, how primitive men has conceived the idea of uh, a supernatural force. What made the early humankind to have some kinds of forms of worship? It could be in the form of animal, it could be in the form of plant, or it could be in a totem symbol, or it could be a higher superpower. What made the early human being in terms of their, in their thinking process? So in that sense, Douglas took uh, some kind of a comparative analysis of religion, particularly from Durkheim understanding of uh, the, the elementary structures of uh, or elementary forms of uh, religious experience. According to Douglas, culture theory, culture is based on again on uniquely human experiences. They encode such classification symbolically and they give this, this abstraction with others. So at one level, what we say that the whole culture is embedded in the people's mind. And when culture is embedded in people's mind, it is how a person's way of life, that means I have to behave in this way. That is what we call as a culture idea. Everyone knows that a person's way of life is this, a person's behavior is like this. So that comes under this whole concept of culture idea, which has been spilled over to uh, what we call the group views and the grid views. Now, what is this cultural bias? Cultural bias plus social relations gives certain way of life. What does it mean? We all culture A belongs that we all are members of society, believe in common that our culture is something unique, our culture has its own merit when compared to other cultures and the kind of social bonding that we have with other social members in a given culture which presents a society's way of life. That means how we govern ourselves, how we exhibit ourselves, the patterns of our life, from all aspects of our life, which gives us a total sum of the way of life that we do or we behave. Now, let us see what is the uh, differences between a group views and grid views, according to Douglas. 
Mary Douglas says that a group refers to whether an individual is a member of a bonded social units and how absorbing the group activities on the individual. I belong to a social group, you belong to a social group, and we are all individual members of that particular group. And these units, various social units, makes us bonding. And we absorb all these things individually because of the collective force. On the other hand, the grid view says that to what degree a social context is regulated and restrictive in regard to the behavior of an individual. In that sense, though I am a member of a society, how or to what extent my behavior is controlled and regulated? I will not come out of that grid. I will not come out of that mesh. Meaning that I am in totally in terms of chains that I should not cross over the kind of elements that which have been embedded. So we can see these two at a group level, we are all there, we are, everyone says that, but at the same time, we are not supposed to come out of this and how it regulates the whole social control within this grid is given at a psychological level, which Mary Douglas explains that, uh, you know, you have to understand these two components uh, together. Only then we can know how the culture process is being regulates at a psychological level. Now. Let us see uh, how different kinds of characteristic features or groups under a people behave at an unconscious level, which is manifested at a conscious level. If the culture promotes individualistic things, then an individual, all his thinking process is centered around the fear of things that might obstruct the individual freedom. Meaning that individual is free to do many things, but if something comes in between, he becomes throttled, he becomes deterred in terms of that something is obstructing the freedom. Then how in this individualistic pattern sees himself is that the individual sees the nature as self-presenting with the ability to establish its own status quo. The individual in this kind of a setup sees that how nature is independent of many things. Individual also tries to identify with the nature and says that I am also like the nature and he tries to maintain this status quo. Contrary to the individualistic setup in a given culture, we have this egalitarian setup where some kind of a fear developed that many may increase the risk of inequality among the people. The concept says that all are equal in an egalitarian setup. Gender-wise, people are equal. Socioeconomically, there is no inequalities. If there is no social, many social disintegration. So there is some kind of a fear. What happens if this chain breaks up? So inequalities may arise. The egalitarian structure may lose it, which is happening at an unconscious level. In a hierarchical setup, there is a hierarchy from top to bottom. Social order is there. Some people are at the top, some people are at this thing. If this is a kind of a structure, there is always a fear that there could be a commotion. When there is too much from the top to bottom, there is unrest. There is a close interlap between egalitarian and hierarchical. In an egalitarian setup, there is a risk and fear that inequalities may arise. In a hierarchical setup, in that kind of a society, understanding, given the natural order may topple down, and that gives a commotion kind of a thing, where the lower group may come with some kind of a thing, or too much of force and coercion takes place. And that gives a chaotic, this kind of a fear is manifested at an unconscious level. In a fatalistic setup, that you are destined to be like that. 
religion. You are destined. There is no fear. I am destined like this. I am bound to be like this. So where is the question of risk and fear in this, in this cultural setup? Again, coming back to the egalitarian, because they see egalitarian is people have this kind of equal status, social, there is no social control and all. But nature is very fragile and it is bound for interventions. Where new technology comes up, there could be some sort of pollution, there should be some kind of a changes taking place in the society. In the hierarchical setup, they see nature as which is self-preserving because of the order that is there. It is there for a long period of time. Hierarchical order is there. Unless it is disturbed. This, when the hierarchy is not disturbed, nature is also like that. In a fatalistic setup, People are unmindful, they are oblivion to the environment and there is no, people are, do not know whether they are doing right or wrong, they are because they are fatalistic. They go on with the same kind of a setup of mentality. So they are mostly on ob oblivion of what is not, what is happening they don't know like because you tend to believe and you tend to cognize the whole environment in terms of that you are determined or destined to be like that forever. Taking further, Arthur Kleinman has elaborated not just only to culture and personality at a structural level, at individual psyche to the collective psyche. He's more prominent towards cultural psychiatry. The, the prefix cultural psychiatry. What do you mean by cultural psychiatry here? Or cross-cultural psychiatry? Or cross-cultural psychology which gives us psychiatry which exclusively deals with all the psychological disorders, the origin, the classification, the treatment, and the rehabilitation process. How does a society perceive a psychological disorder? How does a culture understand normality and abnormality? What is normal in a culture may be abnormal in another culture. What is abnormal in one culture may be perfectly normal in other culture. Why a certain behavior is marked or categorized as a disorder, disorder and why certain individuals are not considered to be perfectly normal. So in this space Kleinman is gave a new impetus to the cross-cultural psychiatry. So Kleinman extensively worked on the various forms of psychological disorder starting with the depression, simple depression somatization, body and mind or soma completely with the body, epilepsy and the highest form of psychological disorder is schizophrenia and personality problems like a suicide and other forms of psychological deviance like many forms of violence which comes in various forms and degrees. It could be individual violence to the mob violence. So Kleinman was trying to understand how a particular society or a culture perceives these disorders, how they categorize these disorders, why people do that and trying to see a cross-cultural comparison. So in this sense there is new brand name as I say, new cross-cultural psychiatry According to uh, Arthur Kleinman, he says that culture and personality have emerged in 
North American anthropology and has continued to give many insights and clues to um, various cultural or psychological disorders. This is also can be understood what we call transcultural psychiatry. Where Kleinman has says that new cultural psychiatry. Now, in the old transcultural psychiatry, it is mostly represented as closed, embedded in self contained worlds, in homeostasis, or in a study state with a substantial degree of homogeneity across individual. In a sense, it is understood that if the body loses its homeostasis, the balance. So we are in a state of balance. And in this state of balance, if the individuals lose their composition, lose their balance at individual level, and at a collective level, the degree of homogeneity between the members are getting shackled, then it leads to some kind of a disorderly state at the individual level and at a collective level. Whereas in new cultural psychiatry, it is understood that local communities that are embedded in larger political structures are constituted by face to face interaction and ways of living together in health and sickness. So, what does it mean? It means that how the community living which protects individual interests, though it could be in a larger political structure. When it comes to small, closed societies, which safeguards every other individual member's well-being. And if something happens to the individual in terms of sickness, so the new cultural psychiatry ideas, insights are being there to give more new perspectives. And the mix of traditions contributes to the distinctiveness among the local world. On the other hand, global forces have process and give rise to new mobile social world. If there is a large scale social change is happening in these societies, what does it happen? In what ways these changes are taking place? There could be changes in political structures, political arrangements, political setups, political regimes. There could be changes in the economic structures, economic organization, and even in the social world, how we conduct ourselves. Another important aspect is migration. When people migrate from one society to another society or one country to another country, they bring a, a, a bag of their own culture. So with their own cultural baggage, with the local culture, there could be a, some kind of juxtaposed or mixed mix way of cultural setting. So psychiatry or psychiatric problems are basically understood because of these social changes. When there is a, too much of social changes happening in the society, which is losing its stability, perhaps that could be a trigger or, a, or a facilitating this psychiatric problems due to globalization process. Until recently, when communities are so stable and sustainable with less deviance, and in the historical process you have this migration and globalization, new agents have cropped in which disturb the whole social life. Perhaps this could be a factors which leads to some kind of psychiatric issues which arise in cultures. 
So according to Kleinman, psychiatry or the whole phenomenon of psychiatry called a serious engagement thus, that must be renewed in each generation. Earlier generation in one particular culture might not have some issues. But this generation in this particular culture have some issues. So in that sense, culture psychiatry illustrates that there is an interdisciplinary approach which has given a new insights to cognitive science and discursive psychology where there is a constant engagement with individuals, with the subject, with the object, with the self, with the psyche, so that we can understand the whole gamut of a psychopathology as shaped by the current discourse which has been an emergent from the whole interpersonal interaction within the family and within the community. So how these whole discourses have come out? Kleinman says that psychopathology should be understood. Earlier I said that psychiatry as a discipline or psychiatric disorders or pathological behavior which comes under psychopathology or should be seen how interpersonal relations are going on at a smallest unit in community, family and at larger level at community. So in that sense, globalization demands new ways of thinking about culture. In terms of cultural hybridization. According to Kleinman, there is no one single culture. There is a blend of cultures. When there is a blend of culture, there is a chance or often to leads to some kind of a topsy-turvy issues or turbulence and virtual exchange. Uh, people are in a flux whether to accept this, whether to accept that. That leads to some kind of a state of discomfort, both at individual level, both and at a community level. And this is how new paradigms or new approaches have given rise to what today we call new cross-cultural psychiatry. So with this new cross-cultural psychiatry, there is an exploration of or understanding of how and why this rapid changing environment with various forces are coming in which are being expressed by the lived experiences of individuals in every moment of crisis and testing individual resiliency. Every individual has certain kind of resilience which is given by the culture. If one is beyond this resilience point which leads to adversity. So it is a testing time when these forces of globalizations are taking place in many societies. Again, we see an important contribution from Anthony Wallace which has given immense contributions towards the culture and personality studies. One of the significant aspect of Wallace is the contributions towards the mental maps where we can understand the cultures. He says that every culture produces individuals with certain kinds of mental maps. And this mental maps facilitates individuals how to behave in a given society with the existing norms and how illnesses are produced and specifically calls as cultural stress 
which is different from individual stress. That means how collectively people experience a stressful situation, which is a new insight given by Wallace. Like traditional uh, classical psychologists which are only interested with the individual stress, psychological anthropologists or cultural psychologists gave more understanding towards this quote-unquote cultural stress. Wallace has taken beyond that how religion also facilitates in terms of conduct of individual behavior, in terms of social norms, in classification of the worldview. In that sense, he gives a new concept called revitalization. So how people revitalize the existing culture into newer ways and what is the process behind this revitalization process? What makes them to go for a newer ways of conduct of life? How do they act out? So Wallace says that it is a psychological process that makes people to go for this kind of a movement. And these movements are basically triggers at one point of time and goes on with a longer period of time, which people give meaning to what they behave. They are purposeful and these movements are meaningful. It could be a change of religion, it could be a change of new ways of life, or it could be an entire co community come together and start operation says that let us not do this, let us come with a new thing. So how does this operate? So Wallace gives more importance to that uh, people have this cognitive capacity or cognitive ability to alter their own behaviors for some kind of an end. So he is more interested with this, the process and the product. So this theory of revitalization takes on what we call the processual approach. What is processual approach? In cultural anthropology, when we say that I am studying a, a, a community on a processual approach means the lived experience, which has also has an historical past. With that kind of an historical past, we conduct ourselves and we try to behave in the contextual approach, what we call lived experience. And this gives to what in a bigger role called the revitalization process or the revitalization movement. To simpler terms, we can say it is a reform movement. Who does this? Who, who triggers this? It could be an individual, it could be collective members and if we look at the whole history, we have n number of movements which have revitalized the existing cultural patterns prevailing in that particular point of time. If you look at, if, if, you, can, if you can see this Wallace conceptual understanding of revitalization or nativistic revitalization process, we can apply to some extent to our tribal communities in India, where they want to have some kind of a movement, which want to change their, alter their status at an ideological level, which spill over in economic and political aspects. Today, you also look at many cults which are being in place, popular cults like ISKCON, which we can see which started in India, which has gone, migrated to the West, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna movement. Various movements in, in, in US, racial, anti-racial, 
movements which are based on social issues. So how does this happen? Then examples are numerous. Or we see the major political revolutions are taken place in this entire political regimes. No, he, he says that there could be four stages of this entire mass movement which is being organized at a cognitive level, which is logically constructed, which they value, which they give meaning to these behavior. It starts with a study stage. Perhaps this could be a second stage of individual stress, whether it could be accepted or this could be this thing or that thing and all. Now, with this kind of a individual stress at some level, there is a, some kind of a delusion. There is a, some kind of a, a, a state where what happens if I take a new form of behavior, I am a shedding off my own old cultural thing, individual and at a collective level. So that leads to a phase of cultural distortion. And it takes on the final aspect of what we call the revitalization process, where the old thing has been replaced by a new thing. So this whole understanding of revitalization, which is basically understood the interplay between culture, religion, and the socio-political processes that shapes individuals' thinking at individual and collective level. Now, why some societies go on with this revitalization process and why some societies do not have this revitalization process and they remain stable, which gives more clues towards understanding of this entire gamut of culture and personality studies. So with that, Wallace has given an excellent uh, uh, concept of uh, this, how revitalization is important, uh, which is occurring in sporadically in many parts of the world, which is basically comes under the whole uh, psychological processes uh, which are embedded in uh, cultural aspects of a given society. Now coming to, to summarize the whole concept of uh, from Mary Douglas, Kleinman and Anthony Wallace, we can summarize saying that Douglas views more on the group views and the grid views. How an individual behavior is being controlled, which has been modeled with a group level, and to what extent at the grid level our experiences are not being spilled over, which do not lead to chaos. Then Kleinman's whole contributions towards cross-cultural psychiatry. How cultures perceive psychopathology, how cultures deal with the psychopathology, why one culture has psychiatric issues, why another societies do not have any psychiatric issues, which gave a new understanding of transcultural psychiatry to new cross-cultural psych psychiatry or new cross-cultural psychology, which is a, a very welcome sign by all the ethnographic studies by citing examples that whether psychopathology is individually biologically based or psychopathology is the product of the lived experiences of in a given culture. Then Wallace's understanding of how and why people collectively organize themselves and change their cultural pattern in terms of revitalization movement or process. What are the different phases that uh, takes place in this revitalization process? First of all, what is the need for to change their own cultural traits at some level, especially when it comes to religion or when it comes to some spirituality matters or certain kinds of uh, socio-political issues which may crop up and which they want to bring a new social order into their society which is given a lot of clues to this what we call by well as native revitalistic or native revitalization process which has given a new paradigms of understanding in the whole school of culture and personality studies.